Hello class, in this chapter we're going to take a look at arrays. Arrays are very, very similar to variables. They're really a collection of like variables. That's one way to look at it. An array is a series or list of variables that are stored together in computer memory where they go by just one name and they all have the same data type. So if I were working with a program that was evaluating exam scores for a class, instead of having a single variable for each student in my class that would hold that individual's exam score, I could create an array and call it exam scores. An array is a collection that could store all of those exam scores for each student. So basically we can use arrays when we have a collection of related values that we want to work with where they're all of the same data type. We need to have a way to be able to refer to each individual value. So for example, if a student Chad in the course, we need to get Chad's exam score. We have to have a way to be able to identify an individual exam score in the collection, and we'll see how to do that. But basically, that's what an array is, a collection of like variables that have the same name. So a little bit of terminology. An element is what we refer to as an item in the array. So going back to Chad's exam score, um, that exam score, let's say it was an 88, um, is one of many elements within an array. So an element is just an item in the array. The size of the array, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, that's the number of elements that it can hold. Subscripts and indexes are synonymous, meaning these two words are interchangeable. It is a numeric value that refers to each element positionally within the array. Meaning, for example, the first element in the array would have an index of zero. The second index in, I'm sorry, the second element in the array would have an index of one. Um, it is a zero based system, so the first item in the array has an index of zero. So you just kind of kind of remember that. Um, it's a bit of a gotcha because let's say we have an array of size 10 where we have 10 different elements. The indexes will start at zero where the first element has index zero, but the last element in the array, because of starting at zero, will have an index value of nine. So I've used the term index. Me, for me personally, that's the term I learned, but subscripts is synonymous. You can use that term. Your textbook often uses the term subscripts. If you hear the term populating an array, it just basically refers to adding data values to that array. So here's an example. I used exam scores. We're switching it up a bit and looking at an array of prices. So if we worked in a uh, retail store and we had a collection of prices that for some reason we wanted to store and work with inside of our program, instead of having three variables, price of item one, price of item two, price of item three, um, that would work if we had a small collection. But if we wanted to maintain a list of say 100 prices, um, we'd find ourselves in a situation of having to create 100 different variables, and it's very difficult to work with and process all of those prices. So we would instead choose to use an array called prices where it stored all three prices. So you can see in this example that this first element has a value of $25. The second element, which by the way, that first element has an index value of zero. It's positioned at position zero. This is index one or position one. And this element's value is 36.50. This element has an index of two and a value of $47.99. These pieces up here are referring to syntactically how we would access any one of those individual elements in the array because we have to have a way in our program 
to access um, each element in the array. So the way that we refer to that is it's called an array access expression. And in pseudocode also, C++, Java, a lot of the C-based languages use this convention. The name of the array, prices, and uh, square brackets. In between the square brackets, you indicate the index of the element you're interested in. So if you typed prices sub-zero is how we say this in your program, it would return back to you the value of the element at prices sub-zero. So it would return back $25. And the same follows for these other two array access expressions. So some characteristics of array, as I said, an array is just a list of data items. Um, they are stored contiguously in memory, which means they're all next to one another. Each data item we refer to in the array is called an element. They all must be the same data type. When we were working with the prices or the exam scores, those would both be of type num, if you're speaking in generalities for pseudocode. Um, if you're going to get specific with a specific programming language, such as Visual Basic, they would all be integer, all be double, etc. Each element is differentiated by an index or a subscript, and we saw that we could use that subscript in an array access expression right here. Here's the subscript zero. We can use that to access an element in the array. And usable subscripts start with zero, always zero. The first element always has an index, i.e. subscript of zero. And each array element can be used in the same way as a single item of the same data type. In other words, each price was itself a num data type that we could work with as any other number. So I'm going to switch up our example here a bit and look at a little bit of pseudocode. One thing that those slides did not show us is how can we in pseudocode create and populate an array Technically, I'm not just populating here, I'm, I'm providing values, I'm also initializing, meaning that I'm creating my array and putting initial values in it at the same time. So let's take a look at this syntax. This is very similar to a normal variable declaration. We have a data type num, the name of our array prices, the difference is inside of the square brackets, we specify the size of the array. So if we want an array to be of size three, so we can store three prices, three is what we would put between the square brackets, equals, and similar to assigning a variable to, I'm sorry, a value to a variable, we're gonna put a value over here, but remember, we have a whole collection of values. So we would specify the three values that we want with a comma in between. This would create that array prices that we saw a few moments ago and um, initialize it to have these three values. Now, this example does not show this, but during the duration or the execution of a program, array values can be updated. Elements can be updated just like any other variable. So I could, in my program, update prices sub-zero from $25 to $26. So that each one works like its own variable. So what I was illustrating in this example is just some things that you can do with arrays. Let's say that I wanted to add up all the prices in uh, the array and store them in sum. One way to do that would be to create a sum variable, as I have, and then set sum equal to the value of the individual elements. So here, price is sub zero, that's going to access $25. Price is sub one is gonna access $36.50, and price is sub two, of course, would access $47.99. So it would add them all together and assign it to sum, and then we would output the sum. This works, this is a workable example, and when we only have three values, um, writing it this way is okay, but it's not the best. Um, one of the advantages of using arrays is that they provide a collection of items 
where each item can be indexed by a numeric value. If you recall our discussion of for loops and iterative logic for counter controlled loops, we can use a looping structure and basically set a counter to start at a certain value and go up to a certain value. So arrays and loops really go hand in hand. So here I'm not leveraging the power of the array because I'm just individually accessing the elements, which is fine to do in an individual context. But if my intention is to loop through and add all three of those values together, um, I would probably be a little more forward thinking and create a for loop in the event that down the road we change the prices array to include 50 prices, for example, where this would get very verbose. So I'm going to replace this with a little bit of code. What did I do here? I added a few things. I added another number. And let's talk about this a second. I called it index. Now, the reason why I called it index is because that is the purpose and uh, in, in the context of how I'm using this numeric variable. However, I want you to understand that it is similar to, and we're going to be using it in the for loop as our counter variable. It's going to be used to start at a certain value and go up to a certain value. So the fact that I didn't call this counter is not a problem. As I explained earlier, that variable can be called anything you want. I called it index because of what's coming in the next statement. So I have this for loop. I start it at zero. I go up to two and I say each time through the for loop, step one, which means add one to the index. So what this does is it builds a looping structure that starts index at zero, goes to one, and then two. That's exactly what we need to be able to point to the first, second, and third items in our array. So what we can do is build an assignment statement that says set sum equal to the existing sum. We're starting sum at zero. So the first time through this says set sum equal to zero plus the first time through index will be zero. So this array access expression will evaluate to prices sub zero, which will access $25. So the assignment statement will say set sum equal to 0 plus 25. It will reach the end for increment index to 1. Remember, the for loop does that automatically for us and loop back around. It loops back around. Index is now 1. So when we get to this statement, it's going to add our current value of 25 to prices sub 1. So it's going to add 36 0.50 to the existing 25. It continues in this way till we get an aggregate of sum that reflects all three elements. And finally, we can output those values. Could we use a while loop for this instead? We certainly could. I would just need to make a few modifications. Going to remove my for loop here. Remember, a while loop can also be used for counter controlled logic. This particular one would be written as while index is less than or equal to 2 or while index is less than 3. I need to add an additional step. Oops, if I am going to use a while loop. Remember that for loops do a few things for us. They initialize index to a certain value. Well, that's something else we need to do up here. Start index at zero. While index is less than or equal to two, do this. But then don't forget, we don't want an infinite loop. So we want to add one to the index to ensure that index is incremented before the next pass through the loop. 
So in this case, we were adding up values, but just so you know, you can use for loops and while loops to loop through arrays to do many different things. You could loop through an output, for example, all the values in a particular array. So I am skipping around a bit here. I'm going to jump forward to slide 44 just to formalize this. So a for loop, remember it initializes the loop control variable, compares it to a limit and alters it. We did see that just prior to that while loop example. For loops are a favorite for working with arrays because uh, as it, the previous bullet point says, it handles all three in a single line of code. So it's very concise. Um, you must stay with an array bounds. What that means is, going back to my example here, if I had accidentally written either in the for loop or here in my while loop, while index is less than or equal to three, and that would be a common error to make because we often forget the indexing does not start at one, where we would say one, two, three, it starts at zero. So this would be a common error to make, but it would cause a runtime error when the program runs. It would say array out of bounds index exceptions. That's the specific error that .NET Visual Basic would give you. Um, so we have to be cognizant of that, whether you're using a while loop or a for loop, that you must stay within array bounds Always remember the highest usable subscript is one less than the array size. So here we have another example. Um, instead of numbers, we have an array of strings. So that's also possible. Um, we called it departments. And apparently we're making it a constant, meaning that these values won't, won't change. So you can certainly do that. You can create an array of constants. And instead of typing five, um, they used a constant 5 here, and that's fine too. I could have also just written 5. Either way works. But we're creating an array of size 5 and initializing it to have the values accounting, personnel, technical, customer service, and marketing. Similar to the last example, we use a for loop, for loop to iterate through. But instead of adding things up, this time the purpose was we wanted to loop through and output each department name. So we wanted to start with the first one and output accounting, then personnel and so forth. So we set a uh, department up here to zero. This is similar to my index in the last example. Again, remember, it doesn't matter what you name this variable, you can, as long as it's a, num a numeric variable. We started it at zero and we went to size minus one. Size minus one is four. So this is really saying start DEP at zero and go to four. Another way to do that is illustrated here. Instead of constantly doing that subtraction every time through the loop, which is a little inefficient, they instead created an, a constant called array limit, made it equal to the size of the array minus one. This has the same effect. It will go from zero to four. It's just a little more efficient because it's only doing the subtraction step one time. Uh, another option would just simply be to write for uh, DEP equals zero to numeric four right here would work. Um, there are benefits to sometimes naming uh, these values, giving them names so that they have a little more meaning than just a numeric four. Um, we're going to see that a lot of programming languages have a length or size property that we can access um, that actually allows us to determine how far up to go, what our limit is. So that's something that we'll look at in the future.